Dana Walsh and I'm running for Congress in Congressional District 8 against Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House. I'm here in the third segment of my talk with my financial advisor, Don Campbell. The first segment, we talked about how we got into this mess. The second segment was how did it go so far? And now we're trying to find out what, where do we go from here? So Don, tell us a little bit about yourself. Anyone who's been watching these knows, but give us a little introduction to your experience. Sure, well I've been, um, I have a, a Master's of Business Administration from Stanford University right here in the Bay Area. And for 40 years I've been involved in business finance in, uh, as a financial analyst, as a corporate executive, as a member of company boards, as an investor. And that's both here in the United States and in different countries around the world. Great. Now, as we've discussed in our other segments, we now have a plan in place. The United States has this, started out as a $7 billion plan. I guess it got larded up by the Senate and it's now an $800 billion, $800 billion plan. How do you see this working? Because I know they had, uh, it seemed that the markets weren't all that impressed with it initially, but it looks like they've come up with a slightly modified plan. Could you tell us more about that? Well, yes. I mean, the day after the plan was finally voted through, uh, the stock market had its biggest drop in, uh, in perhaps in history. I don't remember a huge drop in the market. So most people didn't think this was actually going to work. But now the Treasury is embarking on a program of buying shares from the companies that are in trouble. And I think that's, that's a new approach and it's one that will have an immediate effect. The problem with what they were thinking of doing before and buying loans, troubled loans from these companies, is that that didn't address the problem of their diminished capital. And remember when we started out in the beginning, we talked about what makes an appropriate loan for a lender. And what's appropriate depends on how much capital they have behind themselves. Right. In other words, how much risk they can take and how many losses. By restoring the capital of these companies, we have the opportunity now for them to be stronger and make loans again and, and, and unfreeze the situation. So with, with this new program, there's a good chance that it'll work. That's all we can do now is wait and see if it doesn't work. We'll know that within days or weeks. Really? So that soon? That's right. And so now it's just to let it work. We have a huge program in place. We just have to see if it will work. Okay. Now, can you see things we can do, some positive steps we can take to keep this sort of thing from happening again? Uh, for example, should the government be as involved as it is in some of these financial dealings? Well, clearly, the, the pre present program does nothing but fix the, the deep hole we're in. It doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with the future and stopping this from happening again. So I think one of the things that I think I would propose to you is that we should ditch Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the FHA. Just do away with them. Do away with them. In other words, let them work out the loans they have today, mm -hmm. but not continue to make loans. And the reason I say that is that that we're the only country in the world, the only advanced country in the world that has the government making all these loans to, to homeowners. Uh, right now, 80% of all the new loans being made in the country are being made by the U.S. government. And that's not a healthy thing at all because we've seen how poorly Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac have performed. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have lost all of their investors' money and have now put the government on the hook for five and a half trillion dollars of their obligations. So this is a failed model. It hasn't worked and, and we, should, we should discontinue it, I think. Do you think that's a realistic uh, expectation to have of, of the Congress that will be put into place in 2009? Well, it'll sure be more realistic when you're elected. <laughs> I like that. No, I think it's, 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 it's absolutely what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And you know, the political realities are the political realities. But there's no question that Fannie and Freddie are a big part of the problem that we have now. Right. And I think what's astounding to me, and I think to many people that I talk to, is the idea that Fannie and Freddie are still making loans today. And there are still these 97% loans, 5% down loans. They're still the order of the day. And I think that really has to come to an end and we have to start looking at responsible lending. And it's sort of like subsidizing a business, I would assume. If, if, uh, if, if banks and lending institutions only do loans that they know they expect to have paid back, and they, there aren't guarantees from the government, then they're only going to be giving responsible loans and, and things will start working their way out? Is that 
kind of yes, idea. Yes, I mean, then you don't build up this sort of problem. And, and what do you think about politically of what happened in terms of how Congress related to Fannie and Freddie? Well, I think there's no question that there was a lot of, I don't know if the word's collusion. I mean, certainly um, I was astounded that Nancy Pelosi, when she talked about the $700 billion bailout, was saying that she was going to count on the knowledge, experience, and judgment of Barney Frank. And I think we've all seen in, in, in tapes that Barney Frank is probably the most culpable in this whole thing because he was the one that said, these things, these financial instruments, Freddie and Fannie, they were all safe, sound, nothing could go wrong, and he pretty much blew the regulators off. I don't see how a person with that bad a judgment should ever be involved in this again. And actually, I suppose if you did away with these government guarantees, Congress would be just taken out of the picture in this sort of um, inept uh, look at every This inept way of dealing with things could be a thing of the past for us. Sure. You know, also, as the Treasury, they'll, they'll have some control as they start taking over the stock of these companies. And I'm sure there are a lot of things they can do to make sure that these, again, these things of the past the irresponsible loans, the golden parachutes they gave to other board members, that can all be handled at the same time, I would assume. Oh, absolutely. I think that, that when the Treasury uh, is required to make an investment in these companies to, to carry them forward, mm -hmm. uh, the Treasury is in a position to demand that, uh, that the boards be updated and it may be entirely replaced. Can we the, throw the, the bums out that got us into this? That's exactly what should happen. And the management should be reformed. And they can put in uh, regulation requirements that will, mm -hmm. that will help guide these, these institutions toward better behavior in the future. Now, by and regulations, yes. do you mean just like standards of accounting, this leveraging thing that you had discussed could be addressed? Well, sure. They could, and they could, they could, they could go either through regulation or through, through the Congress to ask, for example, that, that golden parachutes be abolished for these sort of executives and failed institutions so that there's no longer this sort of outrageous behavior mm -hmm. uh, that, that we've seen be rewarded. Right. And so, no, there's, there's a great deal of reform that can come about. So not only is what the Treasury is doing now have the potential of helping the situation very quickly and very decisively, but it can be part of the long-term answer mm -hmm. by requiring better governance in these companies as a price of rescuing them now. Right. Now, one other thing that I haven't addressed before, you know, I told you that energy was one of my biggest issues before this financial crisis hit. Um, I recall that the number, the figure being thrown out of how much we give to foreign countries, generally, you know, that are not friendly to us, is somewhere in the neighborhood of $700 billion. You mean to buy a oil? A year to buy, buy oil, oil and gas. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so... I think there's a certain beauty in the idea of starting to reclaim our energy independence because if in fact that $700 billion is now being sent out of the country, that would be money that we could use to build our infrastructure or to employ our people and it would have a lot of benefits. Do you see that as a possible way out of this? Oh, absolutely, because it's a major part of, of improving employment mm -hmm. and the financial standing of the country. And uh, the advantage of that, too, is that uh, almost all that can be done without government money. Right. There may be some cases where the government can, can, can start a program, mm -hmm. but it'll all work out because if they're economic, there'll be plenty of private funding for them. So, no, I think it's an excellent idea. Your energy platform is, is, is part of the, the answer for the country to work out of this right. because we will have difficult economic times as a result of this. And that, you know, development... Of, of new energy sources, drilling, nuclear, wind, solar, all of this provides jobs domestically mm -hmm. and reduces the money that we're sending abroad. 